We're going to move forward here to another very crucial part of the world, crucial conversation, and that is uh, the aftershocks, perhaps you could say, of the elections in India that I'm sure many people saw at least some headlines from. And we're going to dig into many of the things around uh, what took place there. And we are very, very honored to be joined here on the show once again by Sutracha Vijayan, who's an author, lawyer, and founder and director of the Polis Project. Sutracha, thanks so much for being back with us. Thanks for having me. Well, great to have you here. And I guess my first question is, um, you know, obviously Mr. Modi has come back uh, as prime minister, but with a much reduced uh, majority for his party. Uh, you know, what is behind, you know, his uh, the underperforming, perhaps, the expectations that many people had uh, for Modi and the BJP in this election? Um, I think uh, this was the result that many people expected in 2019. I think we have to understand that the 2019 election results, um, people actually expected Modi to get a much lower um, polling numbers, but then they won in a landslide. Um, I think what we've seen is in the last 10 years, the biggest issue right now is the money. Um, there is the economy is not doing as well. Um, there is, uh, of course, rampant inequality. Um, during the last decade, the top 1% of India's wealthy have gotten richer. Um, of course, there is violence on the ground. And of course, we have to remember that Modi's regime has focused disproportionately on hate speech and just really just creating a climate of um, um, the kind of hate politics that is really targeted towards the country's Muslim population. Of course, their politics also disproportionately targets um, Dalits, Muslims and Adivasis. So what you've really seen here is a decade of a specter state. Like this is a theater state that really did not deliver or perform in any aspect. And I think on the reality on the ground, I think people really felt that. And I think we have to remember that uh, India's rural population is the one that really came out and voted against Modi. And if you look at the breakdown of the votes, the urban sector, the India's already successful, the beneficiaries of Modi's politics, who happen to be India's top 1%, have continued to vote for Modi. But it's the rural sector that's really gone against him. Well, on the other side of that, I mean, the the center left alliance increased its coalition seats by quite a bit. Uh, and some of those seats did go to left parties. So I'm curious if you can talk a bit about the left gains, um, the coalition itself, but also specifically the leftists who gain seats. I think we really have to credit uh, India's social justice movements. Um, the reason the left or uh, the broad uh, left, which is anywhere between liberal and left, uh, vote gain is really the result of activists on the ground who know the people, who really went above and beyond to mobilize and organize. Um, and, and also, I think people forget that while India is called the world's largest democracy, it's been incredibly difficult to do any work in India. Uh, this was not a free and fair election. We have to understand that every institution in India, from the election commission uh, to the police uh, to the judiciary, have all become an extended arm of the Indian state. Uh, there were serious issues with election violations. Certain places saw vote rigging. So despite the immense power uh, and um, this not being a free and fair elections, BJP could not win the expected seats. And that's purely because of the work that was done on the ground level. Uh, I think um, a lot of the liberal to left parties or the opposition parties, I think it's, I think the right way to call them is the opposition parties, um, kind of understood that they have to listen to the people, that a platform that prioritized social justice, a platform that really put women in front and center, uh, really just gave voice to local leaders is what really mobilized this. So I would say the victory really is the victory of local resistance groups, not resistance groups, the local organizers and movement folks who really just did all of the work. And I think, I think that's where the real victory, um, at least according to me, stands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's an important point, and I guess it leads me to some other issues. I mean, this is <clears> – the mainstream press keeps saying we're going to see a changed Modi. It's going to be very different. Uh, you know, it's going to be a whole new world. I mean, I wonder what you think about that around some of the core issues. I mean, you know, the hatred against Muslims, the issues involving Kashmir, other things like that. Are you expecting that having a, a smaller majority will provoke any change, or, you know, perhaps maybe they'll just be less verbose about doing the exact same agenda? 
I think it's very important for us to understand that this was the exact same argument that some of India's most liberal intellectuals put forth when in when Modi won for the first time. And it was the same argument that they said in 2019. They said that the political power will make Modi more moderate, and that hasn't happened. I think what I fear is that Modi is going to be become more vicious simply because there's nothing more dangerous than a fascist who's lost his power. Uh, I think they are going to try and tame and discipline the people who have resisted against them. So I don't see Modi changing his tune. If anything, I have a feeling that he is going to become more vindictive and I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Having said that, I think for the first time, we have an opposition, which means it's going to be hard for them to really push through the kind of illegal, unconstitutional laws that they have kind of pushed through. A good example is the ways in which that they have made the already draconian uh, sedition laws um, and other laws, even more, far more draconian. The right to habeas corpus in India is almost watered down now. Um, so I think all of that has already been passed. It's, those laws are already incredibly uh, dangerous and give the Modi government immense power over the bodies of its citizens. So I think it is good to see a parliament in which there, it's going to be harder for them to pass the laws as they did before. But I, I think it's great and I think we should not be, uh, I think we should be vigilant. And I think it's important for us to understand that Modi is never going to become moderate. And I think that would be a very false assessment. And I'm curious, do, will this have any impact on foreign policy? So just like to zoom out from just the domestic and India's relations with its neighbors. And I, I guess, you know, with the world, its role. I mean, it's even under Modi, it's been kind of taking this role of joining global South countries um, when it comes to certain issues. So I'm curious if you think that'll change at all under this changed, slightly changed government. I I don't know. I think you have to understand that um, Mr. Jay Shankar, who has been the man who has spearheaded this, has been incredibly aggressive. Um, the kind of diplomatic gains that India did have over the years have all been lost. I think people remember when the last time Bernie Sanders actually challenged India's position and called out um, India's position on its rights violations against Muslims, Jay Shankar had actually threw a temper tantrum and refused to meet um, you know, American senators. Um, another thing we have to also understand is that Biden has been writing blank checks to India. They see India has an incredibly important um, ally because it's a large market. And I think they kept pandering over and over again. And they have done that with Modi simply because of the market opportunities it does. Um, but I think there is more discomfort in South Asia because India's neighbors are increasingly getting um, increasingly getting fed up with India's more right wing positions. And I think um, globally, in terms of foreign policy, India has lost of it, most of its gains within South Asia itself. But we really, I don't see much changing within foreign policy, given that I think Biden administration or any administration that comes next has already knows how to get the most out of Modi. Flatter the man and he will give you anything. And I think that is still going to continue. Mm-hmm. And, you know, specifically on a similar point, I mean, I, I wonder vis-a-vis Israel what you expect to see here. Obviously, Modi has made, a, you know, getting close to Netanyahu, one of his kind of trademarks here, uh, and, you know, coming back into power. I mean, maybe just give some context, perhaps, for those who don't know, uh, of what the relationship between Israel and India has been. But if you see any change there or, you know, sort of a doubling down again on the same policies. Um, I think under Modi, um I think the Israel-India relationship has gotten incredibly strong. It's, there's, before, there was always an India-Israel connection. Azad Isa has a brilliant book that kind of maps the history of this. And I would really suggest that book to anyone who is interested in the more historical relationship. But what we've seen under Modi is really a deepening of the military-industrial complex. Uh, a lesser known information that a lot of people should be worried about is that when Modi came to power in 2019, he pretty much offered up the biometric data of all of India's citizens to Israel to run their own tests. So Israel already has access to India's biometric data, data that the government owns. Um, I'm always surprised that this information is never really um 
quite debated. Another thing you see is that we know that for quite some time, um, Israeli IOF soldier, soldiers have been training um, Indian soldiers and cops. You see the port of Haifa, which is now owned by Adani. Um, again, just yesterday, um, um, an Indian, a well-known right-wing Indian journalist and um, a pundit clearly said in their own podcast um, that India should be implementing Israel-like policies in Kashmir, mm. clearly calling for a similar settlement-like building. So what you're really seeing is India wanting to replicate Israel's um, what Israel has done to the Palestinians in terms of the demolition of houses. Again, India has seen a race in the demolition of houses, Muslim houses especially. You see, um, again, the sharing of technology. You see the ways in which uh, surveillance is used to profile Muslims in India. So what I really see is India wanting to increasingly um, emulate Israel, but also India is, an, is the only country that has agreed to send uh, laborers to Israel since uh, October 7th. And again, these are endangered labors for all purposes. So again, sending your own citizens to an active um um, I mean, this is not a war, but still, um, here you have the occupation of the Palestinian people. You have over 40,000 at this point in time, more than 50,000 people killed. And India is still willing to send its own people to go work um, in West Bank and occupied territories. So what you're really seeing is using Israel's model and replicating it. Um, India's used surveillance technology from Israel to target. So, I mean, this could be an entire, I mean, I could spend the next two hours telling you how Israel is going to... Uh, Israel is impacted and continues to impact the state of dissent and resistance in India. Uh, but yeah, um, I think that is going to, again, I, I see more of a deepening of this relationship. And um, yeah, I, I do. I, I don't like to be. I know everybody's really excited that Modi <laughs> has come back to power with much less seats. But I, I also just want people to remember that this means that they are going to they do things in a far more uh, aggressive manner. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, I think that's a critically important point. Oh, sorry, Rania, I cut you off there. Um, go ahead, Eugene. Okay, sorry. No, I was just going to say I think it's a critically important point, and you know, one we'll have to keep watching on a number of of, of different fronts as we keep moving forward here. Obviously, a crucial country, uh, and you know, I'll just. Hope for the good things, and I think what we've seen from the farmers and the workers and the folks at Kashmir of standing up and pushing back has, has borne some fruit, so we'll hope for more in that direction. Sutra Trevijayan, thank you so much for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thanks for having me.